So today, I will talk about personalized medicine, specifically on, in oncology. And I will touch most of the issue highlighted here, including the concept, the promises, success, but the major bulk of the study of the, of the talk will be on the challenges. So, okay. So to my opinion, personalized medicine or precision medicine third today is based on three major milestones, success milestones. The first one is actually the development of targeted therapy. Targeted therapies are either small molecules or antibodies that can inhibit specific protein. And by that, when they developed in the early 70s, tamoxifen, which is a small molecule that inhibits the estrogen receptor and by that prevents its activity, including transcription activity, and it competes with the estrogen for, uh, for its activation. And this drug showed a fabulous response and actually many people, breast cancer patients, survive today due to uh, this potent agent. And as you can see in the graph here that the, there, is, there was a delay or reduction in the recurrent disease of breast invasive and non-invasive breast cancer patients. And even today, after many years of, of intensive treatment using tamoxifen, we, can, we cannot ignore the importance of a single agent on the survival of patients, uh, breast cancer patients. The second milestone came actually in around uh, 1998 when they would develop Glivac as a small molecules that inhibit the fusion oncoprotein BCR ABLE. And this agent actually binds to the pocket of BCR ABLE that it was frequently fusion oncoprotein in CML patients, and this drug was like a miracle. It was much more potent compared to chemotherapy or what called by then the immunotherapy <coughs> using interferon gamma, and you can see that over 90% of patients actually responds very well, and the progression and the overall survival was remarkable. The third milestone was actually in around 2004 when the next generation sequencing came into the field, and by then we've been able in a cheap way and in relatively fast to pinpoint and to match genome to target. And the all rational of this, uh, of this sensitivity or the effect of single mutation on drug are based on two principal concepts. The first one is oncogenic addiction, meaning that if you have a mutation, a mutation induces activation of specific pathway. When you inhibit the pathway, you somehow affect the proliferation and the survival of the tumor cells. And the other concept terms as synthetic lethality. Imagine that you have two pathways that regulate essential uh, process in cell, but one is mutated. So now everything is dependent on the other pathway, and now we can use small molecules or antibody that block the other pathway, and therefore you induce, uh, induce uh, sensitivity. And if you can look, uh, it will give you one example. Usually ALK is, is, a, is a receptor on the cell membrane, transmembrane receptor that is activity depend on the ligand. And in 5% of, uh, of, of uh, lung cancer patients, there is a fusion protein. And now ALK is not longer a receptor, else is active, constitutively active and induce survival of the pathway. And when you inhibit this pathway, using chrysotinib, which is an ALK inhibitor, basically you improve the uh, progression-free survival of lung cancer patients. The other uh, synthetic lethality example is the typical, uh, the classical one is the, the PARP story with the BRCA mutation. So we know that a proportion of patients ha harboring a uh, PARP uh, BRCA mutation and basically by having this, harbor this mutation, you increase the chance to, uh, to harbor genomic alteration. And we know that PARP as well as uh, BRCA regulate uh, DNA damage. So in a patient that they have a BRCA mutation, now all the DNA repair machinery depends on the PARP. So when you inhibit actually the PARP, you induce a catastrophic of the DNA, uh, catastrophic 
in terms of the DNA repair and the cell going undergo apoptosis. And you can see here, for example, the tremendous effect of Olaparib on ovarian breast cancer patient, uh, ovarian and breast cancer patient treated with a, a PARP inhibitor. So the question is, how come we didn't solve the problem with genomic alteration and targeted therapy? And basically, if we are summarizes, if I will summarize the clinical observation, we see, we see two major phenomena. One is low response rate. What, do you, what I mean by that, if this is, for example, a clinical trial that enroll whatever number of patients, each column represents a patient. So if there is a reduction tumor shrinkage, so you can see the bar goes down. If the tumor progress, you see the bar goes up. And basically, you can appreciate that only a fraction of, of patients will respond very well to the treatment. And the other problem is that we have a temporal clinical benefit, meaning that even if you are somewhere here and you have some response, Overall, the tumor, the tumor progress, and the patient eventually will develop a, a resistant tumor and eventually will pass away. So when I will try to think about why we have not been do, do so well with the precision medicine or the, to make a effective treatment using a genomic alteration, I came up with five of many, actually, there are many ex explanations, but I choose to focus only on five which I think are important. And I will go one by one to try to dissect for you and to understand what I mean by that. And I think the first problem that we should appreciate is the tumor heterogeneity and the complex of the ecosystem. And now we know after we sequence so many patients, and this is true, this is example only for GBM, glioblastoma, but it's true for many other cancers, that we have, we have some key oncogenes and tumor suppressors that present in specific cancers. So what do we see here? This is a few hundreds of uh, uh, GBM patients that have been sequenced. Each column represents a patient. Each row represents the genes. And as you can see here, there are some clusters of genomic alteration. So basically what we can say, okay, we can cluster the patients based on the major genomic alteration. In this case, you have PIK3R1, PIK3CA, P10, et etc. et cetera, et cetera. And that's change among the different cancers. However, you, now you can see, oh, okay, it's simple. So let's, let's match now mutation to treatment, and now I'll show you why it's not that simple. Because in addition to the fact that we have genomic alteration, which is only one parameter, we have many other parameters. And one of them is, for example, the plasticity, meaning that the, the cells differentiate to a different classes. In glioblastoma, for example, we have the mesenchymal classes, the classical neural and pro-neural it's meaning that this is by the gene expression profile, meaning that the cells have some differentiation potential. So when now, if we will merge those two parameters together, the genomics and the plasticity will come up with something like that, that you have some cells that are pro-neural and they're more likely to have IDH1 one mutation. And you, if you are classical, you have the EGFR. And if you have a mesenchymal, you have NF1. Is it that simple? Not at all, because if we are looking deep into the data, we can see that it's true that the magnesium chemicals, they have some fraction of NF1 mutation, and the classical, they have EGFR, variant 3, or mutation. But apparently, you can see that also other subtypes have the same mutation, which we think we potentially need to take it into consideration, and today, it's not what we are doing. In addition to that, we, this is, now we talk about the heterogeneity between patients. Now we are going to zoom into, into one patient. So everyone learned from first, the first year in class that everything starts when the first cells get a mutation. Okay, that's true. We get a mutation, the cells start to proliferate. However, we know that over time, cells acquire more and more mutation. And when they acquire mutation, you start to get some phylogenic tree, meaning that some clones start to proliferate more than the others, okay? And if we are looking on a different representation, imagine that this is five years ago before the patient came to the clinic, and you have a mutation, the cells start to, uh, to proliferate, and there you have acquired another mutation and more mutation, and eventually you have 
multiple, multiple subclones. And when the patient diagnosed at this time point, actually, he has acquired heterogeneous disease, which can be reflected in histology, something like that. And the, and the classical, one of the, the first stories that actually describe it very well is in, in a patient with a renal uh, cell carcinoma with a primary tumor and a metastatic, tu uh, metastatic sites. So they took the primary tumor, they sect it into different chunk. You can see it here about R1, R2, R3, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they took also the metastatic sites and they took M1, M2, M3. And now they took all the tumors and said, okay, let's put it in the sequencer and look for genomic alteration. And what they found? They found that there are some ubiquitous mutation, meaning that all tumor cells harbor specific mutation. Fits to our theory that everything starts with, uh, with, uh, with one cell that acquire mutation. However, they showed that there are some unique mutations that are shared only among the primary tumor. It says here, this is the gray zone. However, there are different mutations in the metastatic uh, tumors. Moreover, they saw that actually different tumor, different metastatic sites and different region in the tumor also acquire different mutation, meaning that we have very much heterogeneity and we cannot ignore it. And how it reflects in the clinic, you can see it very, very well, and this is one example of few. This is an example of a patient that diagnosed with a PIK2C mutation, so they gave him a drug to inhibit the PI3K pathway, and the primary tumor respond very well. However, when they did a whole body scan, they found that some lesion responds very well, but some others progress. And you can see it here. This is, for example, lesion for, uh, lesion that, that, that respond. You can see there is no change in the tumor volume. However, there are some other lesions that grew despite the fact that the patient was treated. So when the, the patient passed away, they did the autot autopsy and it collected all the metastatic, uh, uh, the metastatic including tumor cells, the tumor, primary tumor and the sequence, all of them, and they found that all lesions that actually progressed, they harbor a mutation mutation in P10, which is the mechanism of resistance to this specific drug, but the old lesion that did not respond, actually, actually they didn't have these mutations, meaning that we should not expect to give a treatment to a patient and expect that all tumors will respond equally. This is one problem. There is another layer of complexity. Now we are talking about the heterogeneity of the tumor cells within of the tumor cells within specific tumor. And now we're talking about plasticity of the cells. And this is, ex this is with the single cell sequencing. What they did here, they took the, pr the tumor, they sect the, the tumor, took, uh, uh, they sect took the single cell of the tumor cells and put it in sequencing, sequencer, and they look for the, the expression of their profile. And what they saw, they saw that different patients uh, with a different indicator with a different color show a unique path okay for example this patient is quite different from a, this one and you can see it by the distance between the dots however you can see that there are some some shared feature between patients so when they look into deep resolution per patient they discover a very interesting uh, 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 interesting finding that even if you distinguish as a mesenchymal, you remember the four classes, okay? So this patient, for example, was defined as a mesenchymal. In the single cell level, they saw that there are some cells that are actually have progenitor differentiation, and the other different type of cells within the tumor have a differentiation of neural. So meaning that we have within the specific patient heterogeneity of mutation, including heterogeneity of plasticity and differentiation. And this is not the end because we didn't even talk about the 30 or 40 percent of the cells within the tumor that are not tumor cells. Those are the tumor microenvironment. And we have large number different cells that in the tumor microenvironment, in, including immune cells, blood cells, uh, uh, blood vessel cells, fibroblasts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if we look on the diversity of the tumor microenvironment with treatment patients, we can see it, it's quite remarkable that each patient has unique 
quite tumor microenvironment. For example, you can see here with the patient with the red, okay, he has some T cells and some uh, B cells. However, his lack of uh, fibroblasts and lack of macrophages, vice versa, a different cancer type, which green, enriched with NK cells, calf, and, and macrophages, mean that we have heterogeneity within the tumor. So this is only one cell. One of them is the calf, right? It should be like one cell. No, no, no. It's multiple type of cell. We have, so far, we know a, at least four type of cancer-associated fibroblasts, which can classical uh, term as uh, one, two, three, and four, and each one of them has a different role. One is immunosuppressor, the other one is promoting a nutrient to the tumor to grow, and it's a very complex ecosystem. And this is not even talking about what is the effect of the drug on the tumor microenvironment and the tumor cells, because we know from, this is one work of many, that showed that there is a it, there is reshuffling of the tumor microenvironment uh, micro following treatment, and actually the tumor cells can educate the, the tumor microenvironment cells and tell them, okay, I, give me something to survive, and there is a recruitment of cells in the tumor microenvironment which limit the efficacy of the drug. So, so far I gave you one, exa one uh, one challenge of the five, so I'll go to the second one. Is the second one is the identification of driver and tumor suppressor genes. And you know this chart before, and you can see that we have some key oncogenes, but there is a fraction of patients that we don't have like a key genomic alterations. Those can explain be either uh, epigenetic regulation of oncogenes, meaning that not everything is, can be identified by the, in the genome level. But in addition to that, we can appreciate that there is like those, those mutations here. And those mutations here turns as the long tail. The long tail are all the genomic alterations that potentially play a role in the cancer progression and potentially can be a target. But Eventually, if you look in the genome-wide, in the pan-can analysis, you can see that the, the frequency is quite low. So it's going to be challenging to, be, to find a solution for every patient because not for all of them we will potentially have a solution. The other problem is that if we look even in those that we have mutations, for example, with the EGFR, we can clearly appreciate that there are some co-expression of mutation. It's not only sole mutation that this is the problem. And you can have either with a PIK3CA mutation or P53 and a trinoblastoma. And I think so far, when the patient goes to the clinic and goes to the oncology and say, OK, give me the tumor, I'll give it to foundation medicine, and they will give you a list of genomic alteration and we will match the treatment, I think they are misleading because this is only based on one mutation and it's, I don't think that there is sufficient appreciation to the other known mutations uh, or other known mechanism of resistance that can basically can limit the efficacy of the drug. And we'll go back to it later when we'll talk about design of clinical trial, because if we will put attention into it, potentially we can dissect between potentially sensitive and resistant patients. The third one is the quality of drug and the lack of therapy of key oncogenes. So when we talk about drugs, we should think about on-target effect, off-target effect, drug pharmacokinetics, and accumulated toxicity. And I think also the companies appreciate that sometimes they go too fast into a clinical trial without making the optimal drug. And when we talk about off-target effects, meaning that we, we design a drug to inhibit one target, but eventually we inhibit multiple targets. And when we inhibit multiple targets, in one case, we potentially enhance the uh, tumor progression, uh, reduce tumor progression because we have a broader effect. But in the other case, when we talk about a patient, usually if you have more off-target effect, you have more toxicity, more aberrant effect that eventually reduce the chance of the patient to get a, a treatment every day. And the second problem is with the TKI inhibitors usually. It's the poor pharmacokinetic, meaning that the patient takes a pill, it has a peak of few hours of the drug, but then eventually the drug drops so fast, so we potentially needs to take another one, so we have like 
ping pong up down up down it's not stable and in s many cases the drug do not even penetrate the blood brain barrier meaning that if you have a lesion in the brain potentially you should forget about it but i think in that in that sense we are a little bit getting better because today there are companies paid put a lot of efforts of designing a better drug that can be selectively for specific mutation. And I see the light uh, better in that context. And in terms of developing new agents, we know that for key oncogenes, specifically with the RAS family, the NRAS, KRAS, HRAS, whatever, RAS, which are, which are commonly expressed in many cancers, take for example, 97% of patients with a pancreatic cancer harboring this mutation, this, those, uh, this key oncogene must be targeted. And I, I think that we'll be there soon. I don't know how much soon. The, third, the fourth one is drug resistant. We I started the talk saying that eventually patients develop resistance. And today we know that there are multiple mechanisms of resistance. The cells can either upregulate the genes that limit the efficacy of the drug, they accumulate the mutation that bypass, that activate in the pathway. And basically there are many mechanisms of resistance, intrinsic mechanism of resistance, meaning that the tumor cells educated themselves to overcome the, the effect of the single agent. And, and ov obviously there is the role of the extrinsic resistance, meaning that the tumor microenvironment also play a role in the resistance mechanism. So when we talk about drug and patient and match treatment, I think we should forget about giving a patient a single drug because eventually we potentially need to have at least few drugs to improve the efficacy of uh, effect of uh, on, on patient response. And the last point that I would like to highlight is the lack of optimal design of clinical trial. So what I say that I mean that we should do a better clinical trial design. And today there are two ways, if I'll take the, the majority of the clinical trial today, you can basically divide them for two. One is the umbrella uh, clinical trial means that you have a whatever disease of interest and you can basically develop different biomarker and you say if I have biomarker A, I'll give you a drug A. If you have a biomarker B, I'll give you a drug B. And basically today they're doing genomic alteration. If you have EGFR mutation, you will get EGFR inhibitor, etc., etc. The basket trial is a different way to say, I don't care about which uh, cancer you have. I care about only the biomarker. So if you have a biomarker A, you can have either breast cancer, renal cancer, glioblastoma, I don't care. I'll put you in a drug. So basically, you can see here that everything is based on a single biomarker. And I think based on what I showed you, that the report that is the poor and do not take in consideration of mechanism of resistance and basically you cannot Today we are not distinguishing between the patient that potentially resistant and sensitive. Eventually, we need to change the system. And the system should be, the inclusive criteria should not be based on single biomarker and single genomic alteration. And the exclusive criteria should be very well defined by a validated mechanism of resistance. And how we can improve clinical trial? Basically, we can I think we should support it with the functional study. You know, association is one thing, but we should do better. And there are multiple, uh, multiple approaches. Some of them are cheap, some of them are uh, expensive, but it doesn't really matter. I think we should provide it with a more of a functional study. The second thing we should, we should consider to be flexible. We cannot imagine that we'll give a patient a drug and see what happens. Things should be monitored over time. And one of the options is to use circulating tumor DNA because we know for what we know so far that circulating tumor DNA can be a very good an indicator for response. For example, we, see, we can see a reduction in circulating tumor DNA before the tumor shrink. And we can see an increase of circulating tumor DNA before the tumor, before the patient actually progressed. But in addition to the quantity, there is also a quality because you can define those molecular biomarkers. And basically, you think about the option that you can 
profile the, the circulating tumor DNA over time and basically adjust treatment based on the molecular profile of the treatment ongoing. And this will require, uh, require flexibility of the system and it's not so trivial today. And the last thing is the optimal treatment and reduced accumulate toxicity. Today we are in the strategy for most cases. Let's give all the guns together, all the treatments together. And basically what happened, we, we eliminate the sensitive cells, we rapidly induce the proliferation of the resistant cells, and the tumor eventually, and the patient eventually progress with the resistant tumor. We should think about, you know, play with, with the schedule, maybe to keep some holidays, maybe re-challenge the, tumor, the, the patient with the same drug, etc. And over time, we should maybe achieve a prolonged duration of response. So my major conclusion is that the personalized therapy era is not yet over, but much is need, needed to, be, to improve it. Thank you very much. Questions, please. Any questions? Yes, over there. Given the heterogeneity that you pointed out, I would uh, suggest that protein based inhibitors as drugs will never be able to work as a personalized. Uh, however, because of the heterogeneity, uh, drugs based on nucleic acid sequencing could work. In other words, genetic medicine that focus on the specific sequences that distinguish this heterogeneity, such as anti Potentially. I think there are many ways to think how we can do it better, but I think as much as I learned from my very little and short experience in, in science, that everything that we think that will happen, we get the uh, surprises from unexpected, uh, unexpected avenues. And that's true that potentially you can uh, think about uh, using those probe or, or nuclear acid treatment, but I think that should be Consider as an approach, but we need to see how how it actually affects uh, in life. But it's worth trying. Obviously, today we can see from the data that we should try everything. I don't see any restriction why to eliminate different ideas. I won't eliminate yours. Mm -hmm. More questions? So we will thank Moshe because we are. <laughs>